On to the first question. Please stand up, identify yourself, no statements, straight to question. Can someone get another mic? Do we have another question here while you, we fix the mic? Right. My name is George Raza, Chaplains for Christ International. Um, I would just like to ask the policeman, the police officer. Um, uh, I've, uh, I've, uh, I've seen a lot of bikies, bikies. And I think uh, your, the counterpart there from New Zealand, the, is High Commissioner from New Zealand? Um, What's your question? My question is, how are these bikies that have been kicked out of Australia or have been kicked out of New Zealand uh, setting up chapters now in Fiji? How is that possible? Can you repeat your question, please? Um, bikers, bikies, we call them bikers in Canada. Um, as as uh, the, sorry, I, I, I'm the first gentleman there, he was talking about um, how we see the evil and the enemy, but sometimes the enemy's smiling and sometimes the enemy's doing this, but they're the real enemy. And uh, I've seen bikers now coming from Australia, bikers you know, motorcycle gangs, set up in Fiji. And uh, the first time I saw it was three years ago. So I went to YouTube because it was a biker uh, gang that I had never heard of. I come from a place uh, in Vancouver where the uh, biker gang, the Hells Angels, was the strongest club. And even growing up as a child, we never mentioned their name. We never, we were so fearful. And uh, when I was driving one day, I looked in my rear view mirror and I saw these bikers. And I looked at the chapter and it said Fiji. So quickly I went to YouTube and I was doing some research. And uh, the police commissioner in Australia, he said, these guys are a cancer to our society. And now they have so much legislation against bikers. But now I see them set up two chapters in Fiji. I mean, uh, is anybody looking into that? Or I don't know if somebody's here doing it. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah, we know about the bikers, eh? And there are two associations here in Fiji. And we are actually uh, monitoring them. Thank you. Um, can I just, just to add to that question, how is it possible that they get their visas, they get their motorcycles, they uh, set up these chapters here when there's so much research, if you look at their, they're not just a bunch of beer guzzling, partying old men driving motorcycles. How is that possible? Okay, this, uh, for the uh, bikers that we have here, these are locals. There are two associations here in Fiji. If you have the names of those that are coming from abroad, that is what we are looking for. I'll see you. Because we have already profiled all these bikers. Thank you very much. You can forward the information to uh, the head of uh, drug intelligence. Next question, please. Vinaka Bulubinaka to the panelists and Bulubinaka to everyone. My name is uh, Ali Pati Senikuta from uh, I'm a Matin Tikin of Rao. And uh, I have a question to Mr. Temo. Uh, I heard this morning someone from the other side from the house taking uh, baby steps to legalize marijuana. What are your stances, Mr. Stemo, towards that uh, opinion? Thank you. The answer to your question is uh, a political one. It's not for me to answer it. That's for the politicians. 
I, I, I'm there only to apply the law as it is in front of me. Now, if they want to legalize the marijuana, that is for the politicians, not for me. I only look after the Illicit Drugs Control Act, and I apply that. So if you're smoking marijuana and you think it's legal, then you come before me. Sorry, I'll have to send you inside. Thank you. On to the next question. Uh, is there any um, alternative to incarceration uh, and rather sentencing to drug treatment programs being studied? Who is that question for? Whoever can answer it. <laughs> From the judicial viewpoint, we're no longer interested in small uses of uh, marijuana. Because in the past, we found out that uh, the system was locking these people up in jail while the biggest offenders like cultivators and those who are engaged in the business of selling and profiting are not being prosecuted. So as far as young users, those who are caught with one bullet smoking in a nightclub, we give them a slap in the wrist, send them home. We are not interested in you. We are interested in the ones who plant huge marijuana, like in Kandavu, Pra, etc. Uh, for drugs, yes, we are also interested in the, the big ones. And um, for the hard drugs, and I've just found the tariff here. Uh, if you possess, uh, say, category one for hard drugs, and I'm talking about methamphetamine, uh, 0 0.5 grams, you're looking at two and a half years to four and a half years imprisonment. So, and if you're found in possession of five grams up to 250 grams, you're looking at three and a half to 10 years. That is a law in Fiji now. If you are in possession of supplying 250 grams to 500 grams, you're looking at nine years to 16 years imprisonment. So if you're in possession of one kg up, you're looking at 20 years in life imprisonment. So what the laws is saying, we're not interested in the small users. We are after the big ones, big guns. And uh, we're challenging the prosecution and the police to come up with these big guns because we want to spend our time and energy on them. On to the next question. Uh, kia ora, Bulovinaka. Thank you all panelists for your service to us all. Speak up, please. Um, thank you for your service to us all, panelists. Uh, my name is Emma and I'm a concerned citizen. Um, I guess my question is uh, for the Lieutenant Colonel uh, primarily, but also anyone else on the panel. Um, is the war on drugs really still the best terminology and or approach given the position statements from international groups such as the International Drug Policy Consortium and the Global Commission on Drug Policy, which is chaired by Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, um, whose position statements highlight that a prohib prohibitionist approach and the so-called war um, is leading to tragic consequences socially and politically. The question is, is the war on drugs the right terminology to be used? No, but it's the one that invokes the most emotion and it's the one that I think through a media cycle actually galvanises people, but really can it be put into an operational context to actually combat? Uh, as I said before, there's two parts, isn't there? There is about protecting the population, which is everyone from reform users, health and education, but somewhere along the line, agencies who are charged with law and order need to also be included. Too many examples of using the war on drugs and seeing it fail. Again, as I said before, if you are going to engage nationally as your number one priority and you're going to dedicate all your resources, then at the very start, perhaps bring in those people who can align some sort of strategy that will marshal all of your national resources not just for today and not just for tomorrow, because it's a generational issue. We're talking 10, 20, 30 years. But you're right, is it useful as a term? Absolutely not, because it's an innate, it's an innate 
uh, idea to talk about a war on a drug. Drug is about people, and it's about a contest of others who are trying to fight for our community. So our community needs to respond, and the first response is to safeguard the community, and that's the most important. That's a great question. Thank you. Just uh, there was a question that was raised uh, in the first panel discussion uh, to the panel in relation to the proposal to decriminalise the usage of drugs and uh, to focus on the supply. Uh, since we have the law enforcement agencies in the judicial department here, relevant question. Okay, if uh, you do a study on uh, all over the world in regards to drug enforcement, one of the things that come up of, uh, to, what is to legalize the drug is actually when uh, legalizing of these drugs is when the powerful drugs like methamphetamines, cocaine um, and heroin are coming up. They try to uh, do a biological control to send in a smaller one so that people divert to, to actually uh, cannabis. This is all over the world. They legalize cannabis. They legalize cannabis for them to move on to cannabis, but it failed. As uh, the, um, the speakers that were talking this morning, in Canada, legalize and then something happens. They mix it with other chemicals. All over the world, they are using this as a biological control. Read me correctly when I say this. It's a biological control. It's a diversion. Thank you. Corrections. The proposal to decriminalize usage and focus on supply. I think it's a very challenging question. Eh? It's very challenging. Uh, as um, our speaker mentioned early on, you need to look at the source. You need to look at the source. Because the users, they are the end product. We need to look at the ones that actually uh, cultivate all the sources. Uh, with the receiving end with corrections. From the judiciary system, we have been incarcerated. But then we try our best to identify and categorize the type of offenses related uh, and under the use of uh, drugs. Uh, and we try to make our best to what we actually did, we did assessment. We have been doing individual assessment and we need to identify the treatment plan. No two inmates can be the same. Uh, we have a lot of, like earlier mentioned, the cultivators, the source, the suppliers with us. And most of them in, in the moral for their turn as well. They do the crime, they serve the time. Then we try to bring out what can be done differently for them. It's a very challenging question for all of us when we look at the way forward for Fiji. Because when we look at the inmates incarcerated in Sinu, it's a young offenders institution. We try to make a difference in their lives. And when we did assessment, a lot of them use drugs, part of the contributing factors to the criminal behavior. Then. What actually that we try to identify in here, or as a way forward, because they are users. Whether we need to incarcerate them, because they are users, as I mentioned earlier on, or question, big question, the suppliers. I, I, I actually would suggest that uh, well, we need to look at the source. But it's big time, because if we look at the other end, 
in the first place, why they cultivate? Why they actually plant in the beginning? Have we ever done a research to identify the suppliers and the reason behind? Just a statement of your view from uh, the judiciary, uh, the proposal to decriminalize usage and focus on legalizing just folk, the law enforcement agencies to focus on a cracking down of the suppliers? I think um, it's not proper for me to uh, comment on uh, matters that are not legal yet. So legalizing um, marijuana, mm. that's an area we in the judiciary stay away from. Mm. That is for the politicians to debate. Uh, the judiciary only acts on acts of parliament that are put in front of us. So, so far it's for society to debate it, and if they agree with it, take it to the parliament, and if it passes, then we are obliged to implement it. As of now, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, it's not appropriate for me to comment on that. Thank you. I'll do your next question. Question, please. My, my question is, uh, Mr. Masitambu stated that there's an increase in meth eh, in our country. Uh, do you consider do you consider the increase is there a correlation between uh, the increase of meth in our country and uh, we've had locals who've lived overseas for a while who were incarcerated and they've been deported back into our country uh, it's the same with Samoa and Tonga uh, do you consider these people bringing in drugs Okay, uh, in regards to the, the ones that are actually deported, we have, uh, we have uh, cases that uh, they actually contact us through the Interpol. All those that are actually deported because of uh, drugs, we monitor them. And majority of these uh, uh, deportees are, are involved in uh, methamphetamines distribution in Fiji because they still have relatives uh, back in the States and uh, Australia, New Zealand, in which they are sending them uh, things through the parcel post and now through the ports. Yes. Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you. My question is for Mr. Masitambu again. You have identified areas that have major marijuana issues, such as Kandavu, Novosa, Ra, uh, what strategies do they do you have in place to combat these issues in these areas? Okay, Vinaka, uh, as I've uh, you seen our friendly forces that we have, we actually go out, we form uh, crime committees in the villages. As uh, was um, said by Director of Social Welfare, we do not create uh, wheels. We just go on to the platforms that are there in the the, uh, the cultures, uh, the, the structures that are there in the villages. We just follow those uh, structures and we go on to the, every Monday they have uh, uh, meetings, village meetings. This is where we go and actually uh, create uh, the crime committees from those, uh, the, um, the village uh, meetings. And, um, and also the other structures that we have faith groups and all that. We follow that and we also drag in the other ministries like agriculture, fisheries and uh, the NGOs. For example, in Nabosa, they actually build a, uh, a, a market up there in Nabosa, NGO, SD, that's uh, from the SD. They form that and uh, they just bring their uh, crops there and not to Suba and not to Singatoka. They just br uh, bring it there and uh, um, the wholesalers from Suva goes there to to Kiasi. Thank you. Question here. We go to you, and then the back come back. 
Thank you. Um, Bulobinaka. My name is Dipti. I serve uh, Fiji Disabled People's Federation. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Leadership Fiji for this great initiative and um, um, to, uh, to take this leading role towards this um, critical issue that we all face as a society. And um, also a thank you to the guest keynote speakers, moderator, panelists, and the audience, of course. Um, before I come to my question, I, I would just like to quickly um, share with you my personal view uh, that we, we need to relook at our homes, our communities, our long forgotten good old values, and reconsider our priorities as families, individuals, community partners, and as Fijians. So, um, my, my question is not only for the um, panelists before us, but um, to all the panelists um, um, in the first session and the second session. Um, how disability sensitized are your programs towards inclusive development? Um, number two, we heard about the importance of awareness and information information sharing from this morning. Are these accessible to all persons with disabilities, with various disabilities? And when I mean accessibility, it's in the form of physical accessibility as well as accessible communications format. Number three, what are some of the specific strategies and plans you have to strengthen this in future? Thank you. Naka. Yeah, I think we'll quickly go through those questions because there's many other questions. We'll start with uh, left of Kurt. Could you um, say out of those three questions, which was the most important one, please? Well, they're all important questions, <laughs> but um, okay. So how disability sensitized are your program towards inclusive development? How? And sorry, how disability sensitized are your program towards inclusive development and the accessible formats of information sharing? Uh, you're right, I think and there was a familiar question similar to that from the last panel in terms of access to information. I mean, this becomes again to a privacy issue and again how society wants to moderate its own community's information to the world. I mean, if we go back to uh, the internet, the good and the bad, and we know that already. Uh, some people use it for massive good and others that leverage off that to create their own networks. So I guess the partitioning between what is good information and bad information that's something I think that needs to go to the whole community, the whole country to decide. Certainly you have um, your political leaders and your sort of leaders within ministries, but this is an issue for society to decide, especially when you go down the path of what access and what kind of sites are open to the communities, because right now the world is a free reign for everyone. I just want to make a personal comment that um, the opportunities now to enjoy, I guess, a hedonistic life in the past, it used to be saving up money and enjoying a flight overseas and enjoying that life. Now you can do that for less than $20, whether it's through a puff, a prick, or whether you are inhaling. And so that access through networks, through phones, and through the internet, and networks of people, that's here right now. And so your question is, how do we sort of stop from being uh, desensitized to that in communities? That's a, that's a broader question that hopefully across the panel they'll get to. Okay, uh, I would like to thank uh, the question is for today. Uh, when we talk of uh, disability and decent cessation of information, Within the Fiji Correction Service, there is uh, four divisions. So one in the Northern Division, one in uh, the uh, Southern Division, one in the Western, and one in the Central Eastern Division. 
We have, as I mentioned earlier on about the through care uh, concept, it's the community base. Within the community base, we have signed about six uh, symposium on care committee and network with the six provinces. And uh, five from the provinces and one from the faith-based organization. And on top of that, we have been doing a lot of, as I would mention today, very aggressive in our awareness. Not only in symposium, we also conduct this Friday on the 15th of this month, there will be an employment expo conducted in the Western Division. Earlier on this month, we did our yellow ribbon walk, not in Suva, but in the Western Division, just to share information. And we also have a website. Because dealing with the topic today, say no to drugs and no to prison. It's not a place for somebody, especially with the teenagers, uh, the young offenders coming in. And there's a lot of fathers coming in. When we do assessment, there's a program that we call the True Identity Program. Until and unless they know who they are, only then they can know the way forward for them. That is why assessment is very, very important for us. And we usually have family members coming in for these stations. We have a family day for inmates in all divisions. And we have been going out, outreach programs, not only for within the central division, but also from other divisions as well, uh, taken ownership by their supervisors and officers as well, to reach out to to people on the information that we have. And when it comes to disability or people with um, special needs, it's very important that we need to have um, someone from their community who fully understand them, especially within the family system. As I mentioned early on, from, day, from week one, we usually work together with family members. We cannot work in isolation. We need to work with family members because at the end of the day, they will discharge to their loved ones. Thank you. There's uh, two relevant issues also in relation to law enforcement. It's been in the news also in relation to uh, uh, the drugs team uh, within the police team, how it has to ensure that information is confidential within the force. There have been some police officers. Uh, it's been alleged that they have leaked information uh, before drug raids have been uh, conducted, so that's a big challenge. Uh, if the police uh, can comment on that, maybe from the New Zealand perspective, you would have uh, had uh, challenges in those areas. And uh, the other one, in relation to uh, the increased discoveries of drugs in prison facilities, even uh, the Commissioner has had a few conferences showing what has been taken into the prison facilities. Okay, Vinaka, in regards to the, um, uh, the information that is sent in, if you um, actually uh, know about police officers' involvement, this is what we, we keep on hearing this, police, involved, police involvement. But we are still waiting for, for the public to come in with the names or the number of that vehicle that actually go into the drug dealer's place. And uh, we are also following up on uh, uh, the information that are with us. And actually, uh, from our Commission of Police, right down to the uh, first grade, and we also have, uh, uh, you had in the news, there are police officers that smoke uh, marijuana in the barracks. And actually, uh, we are on to that. And uh, you know very well that um, cannabis is actually uh, expensive. And... Um, it's a good money from these drug dealers. They say it's good money. And they pay people to actually move the drugs. And the best uh, people to be involved are, uh, I think, uh, they say, police officers. And we are still waiting for the public to actually give us that information. My number is actually 9905-472. And some of the public are actually hesitant to call the, the police stations. Because somewhere in the police station, there are leaks that actually inform the drug dealers that who the caller was. So if you are actually hesitant to call the police station, you can call us directly. 
the drug intelligence. We are actually on to this uh, offices too. Uh, Mr. Masitambu's number again, 9905472. Uh, you can contact him directly and we have actually forwarded information which they've acted on in uh, cracking down on people selling drugs. Now on to Justice Temo wanted to make a comment. One of your, one of your questions was sharing information. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. If the members of the public want to know what's happening to drug cases in the courts, uh, thanks to, thanks to uh, Pak Lee, if you want to know the laws on drugs and what's happening in the court, uh, the judiciary has an open policy. All our decisions are in Peckley. If you want to know about a particular case, all you've got to do is access Peckley and you'll see the cases. The cases that I've been reading to you are all on Peckley. Anyone is allowed to have a look at it at no cost. Thank you. You go Peckley uh, is an important tool to have to get any details on uh, court judgments in relation to uh, all the details, and also I think USP supports that program as well. Uh, Fiji Correction Service and the increased discovery of drugs in prisons facilities. Drugs as uh, what we have done differently now, uh, we try to work with uh, family members. Um, community have been throwing in drugs, even though we try our best for security and safety purposes. but. I think the awareness need to go into the community on how well they are can assist their loved ones in the period of incarceration. Because the ones that have been uh, trafficking in, they will be taken to task. That is for one, that the practice that we have done now. And also, the inmates concern, they will be also taken to task. We have tried our best. When they come in, they, we do search for the individual inmates. But one way or the other, always remember, we can not do so much. We need everyone to come and give hand on how well we can prevent drugs from entering any prison institution. Thank you very much. Question up there. Hello. My... There was... Thank you very much. My question is to the Mr. Tambu, uh, Mr. Tambu. I have three questions. First one. One question, please. We one, don't have enough time. Okay, one I'll put all the three questions together. They'll be too long. One question. Okay. During Thank lunch, you can ask him the other two. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you think it is, it is uh, good enough to say marijuana and hard drugs on the same tone, on the same line? And on your presentation, you said 1938, it's old drugs. Since 1938, to the low lab, and this current times, how? Uh, sorry, guys. Na bitter tara bini kena basi kana kango may nangon na ya. Na kena biya waki 1938 to low dala. Na kena bitter tara bingo. Induan na case ta di kemo sa taka ba may lori kina o kongo basi kito ko may na biya korkoro. Sembasi ke tuguna lomani tauni rural or open and if in open as in uh, what as one of, one of the common factor kwel imbasi ke tu make no hard drugs ngo first so all my three questions are in there mr okay. mastambo okay vinaka okay um before it was only uh, cannabis eh semarwan Okay, we do not use hard drugs. That is one thing. Eh? Hard drugs was actually taken away in 1970 because it actually, actually uh, made uh, meaning for the young people. They say soft and hard. Okay, we use narcotics and psychotropic. That was started in 1970s. Okay, we use the names and we do not use uh, hard and soft. Okay, and uh, first of all, for Fiji, when it came and uh, when I say uh, it's an old drug, the formula is still the same from 1887 till now. The only things that they are mixing in now is fentanyl, red poison, and they are mixing everything with anything. 
everything with anything. And I can even start again back to say because they use methamphetamines, they no longer feel the rush of the high. They mix in cocaine. Now we receiving uh, samples with cocaine and heroin. Um, yeah, um, um, methamphetamine with uh, cocaine. Both are stimulants. Cocaine, methamphetamine mixed. And this is from the street dwellers and some of the business people that actually take that. Some of the things that we are getting now, it's green methamphetamines. Once we see green, it's actually only a green substance is sold in the, in the shops. Red poison. It's green. If you have a red poison that is red, then come to me. I want to see that too. It's green. When you see it's green, it's red poison, then we'll know it's mixed with red poison. But our machines, actually the latest, we are in power with China, Singapore, our machines that we have, analysis uh, machines that we have. It, red poison and all these chemicals are not yet catalogued in that machine. Until it is catalogued, then we will see that the formulas that will appear. The formulas for methamphetamines is still the same. There's three types of uh, ones using pseudoephedrine, P2P, and the other one is, uh, I forgot. There's three types of methamphetamines. But two types, the main type is the, the level and the dextromethamphetamines. But produced in 1887. And then it evolved till today. Now, a follow-up question to that. Some of the chemicals that are being used to produce that, there is concern that some are being sold on pharmacy shelves? We just go onto the internet, how to make methamphetamines. It's there. As I've shown, they actually went up to use brasso, um, butane from um, the, what's it called, the... Um, from the spray, the aerosols that we have, butane. And uh, we have um, the mosquito, the spray for the mosquito. All that, they mix all that. If it's a poison, if it kills something, they'll use it. Next question. Let's go. Don't have time. Next one, that side. Yes, thank you. My question, of course, again to the representative of the Fiji Police Force. Um, you've indicated in your presentation about where exactly the drugs are situated in terms of the movement of it, particularly in the villages. One of the concerns that I think I'd like to ask is, how is the relationship with the Fiji Police Force and our customs and immigration like? Because recently in Fiji's cases, a majority of the drug busts have also been at the airports, and those are the main point of entry. So I would like to know, where, how is the relationship in terms of ensuring the stability and enforcing the security of drugs coming into the country and drugs going out of the country? What's the relationship like between the two parties? Okay, with the police and the customs, we have a unit that is combined, which is called the Transnational Crime Unit that is with the police and the customs, and also our dog units, the uh, FDDU, Fiji uh, Dog Detection, uh, Fiji Detection Dog Unit, are combined. We are working uh, closely with, uh, there's no uh, uh, hindrance in our work. Once they detect, we move in. We take it down from there. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is the question for OC Intelligence Drugs. My name is Amit Chan, CEO for Defense Logistics. Uh, hard drugs is always an organized crime. That means even if to purchase one kg of uh, methamphetamine, you need six digit figures. Why it is so hard or what are the challenges the Fiji police force is facing locally? Because if you see Fiji, we always say it's so, such a small nation. Everybody knows somebody. If you go in a taxi, I can ask where I can buy a drug, I know where I can go, the driver will take me. So why it makes it so difficult for the Fiji police force to deduct these people and bring them to justice or uh, curb it? 
That is a local, every ordinary citizen's question today. Okay, Vinak, um, for the police force, we have um, 183 targets, super area. Going down more than uh, 200 from uh, Super Nusuri. We target all the, uh, the dealers every now and then. But these things keep on flowing. And most of these uh, dealers, they do not stay inside the house. They stay out. They know the law. They usually drop things beside them or put in the hedges. Once we go in, we move on, we search them. No, we search along the hedges. Flower beds and all these places, that is where we, we find it. Because the law states found in possession. Unless we put some uh, uh, surveillance officers along the place, then we can get them. There are a lot of them that are out there. We are actually doing our best to, to actually this. And, uh, and we rely mostly on the communities. It is the communities that are not uh, actually giving us what to, or the information. The number to call again, 9905472, with uh, information. Question at the back there. I have a question uh, regarding uh, this can uh, be answered by any of the panelists. This is regarding the graduations of the users to peddlers from first category, like mentioned by the Honorable Magistrate, then goes on. Do you have a case study of the first category that been caught from the first time and goes through the system into the correction facility that graduated from the first category to the second category to the third category. Because these people, they graduate as they go along. Because in prison, uh, the madam psychologist knows very well, they have both the big pushers and the farmers. That's where most of this uh, First category, they, they go, get big, big context. Do you have a case study for that? Please. Anyone? Okay, we, we, have, uh, we have the PUs, eh? the youth dealers, and we have the dealers, and we have the suppliers. Eh? And we have the traffickers that actually bring it across uh, by boats, by a taxi, or the LT that are going on now, rentals. We actually already profile all this. Uh, they are in. Um, they are not actually stages. Actually, what they do, the job that they do, PBs, those are youth dealers, dealers, suppliers, and the people that bring it to the suppliers and uh, the cultivators. Thank you very much. Question here from William. Shortly, uh, well, after lunch, we're going to have to take on the challenge of putting all this together and coming up with a, a document, some recommendations. Just, just a thought uh, for the panel, and I'd like your opinion on this. Assuming we had rehabilitation centres in Fiji, would and uh, and I'm and and uh, Lieutenant Colonel might be able to uh, provide us with some. Uh, background from New Zealand, because I understand in New Zealand recently there's been a change in, in the way the police handles uh, users in particular, and often they, are, they have been given the option to then refer users or addicts to rehabilitation rather than to bring them into the system uh, in, and, and turn them into criminals. Do you think that would be a, I mean you're dealing with these people all the time, would that be a good solution for us if you had that option of, of being able to divert uh, addicts to rehabilitation rather than through the judicial system? I think that's a good idea, but it will have to be done through legislation. Because really, we are not the law if you're after the users, you're, you're fighting the wrong, wrong person. What you've got to go for is the, the source people, the people who bring this drug into the world. 
and cultivators. Right now, as far as Mars Juana is concerned, we, we're really not interested in those who are category three down. Less than, uh, we're more interested in 4KG up. Even now, 4KG is becoming like peanuts. You know, what we are seeing in the courts now is 20 kg. People are cultivating 20 kg, 190 kg of marijuana. And you, you can understand the villagers from their point of view because a fiberglass full of marijuana from Kandabu, you bring that in, into Suba, you get $15,000 cash right away. So how can you tell a villager who survives on nothing but cassava, and he, he wants some money, all he's got to do is load up a fiberglass, come to Newman, and there's a dealer there waiting for him with $15,000 cash to give it to him. So it's a big problem, but I agree with you. Uh, our politicians should think about it in society. You, uh, you own parliament, your representative are there. Tell them, take it away from the users. Go for the main culprits, the manufacturers, the cultivators. Thank you. It's a very good question. I think uh, the idea and the thought on uh, having a rehabilitation center is very, very important for us, uh, especially when we look at uh, the changes an inmate have done, for example. Then returning to the big community without support and continuity of care, that is a big question. Whether the person can recommit or there is an area for them to be educated, go through treatment, and uh, ready for social reintegration with the support, uh, community-based uh, place so that they can continue uh, to become, I would say, abstinence from uh, drugs. Thank you. Uh, I'm wearing the wrong uniform, the wrong coloured uniform to talk about, I guess, our um, police and judicial approach in New Zealand. This is comparable to, again, back to insurgency and counterinsurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan. There was a time and period in those wars where everyone in the village, males mainly, were arrested, whether there was evidence or not that they were part of the insurgency. Similar, because the problem with that is you arrest one, that creates three more, regardless of evidence. So the main issue as a change was actually not to do that, to lower the threshold, which is the equivalent now, I think we're talking about users and deciding what a threshold, because that is a, is a vulnerable group that does need to be integrated back into the society, otherwise you create this perpetual cycle of another group who may be incarcerated that create a second wave of hardened criminals. Because the fight is not just outside in the communities, there's also the ability for some of these greens to create very powerful groups inside. So from an insurgency perspective, it's got to be very, very clear whether that person is doing harm to the village or to the force, the military force. If they're not, then the threshold lowers and the village should be dealing with them. But I do believe that re rehabilitation, a personal issue, has got to be something that's seriously considered because that just exposes another vulnerable group to those who are after profit and power. Okay, with uh, the users, um, we actually uh, formed the, the task force, the National Narcotics uh, Task Force. And uh, we already worked on the, the new legislations uh, that we think to actually address the users. Uh, we count them as uh, sick people and it's already there and uh, the only thing that is left is for our minister to uh, to actually take it up to cabinet. Thank you. Thank you. We've got five minutes left. Keep it very short. Your questions, please. Thank you. I've just been making some calculations here and noticed uh, I'm directing this to the assistant superintendent uh, uh, in charge of our drugs uh, department. Uh, I noticed that cannabis was around our country for uh, 77 years before we had the first uh, metamethamine in 1978. 
So looking at it, it's like from 1942, we first got this cannabis in Fiji, according to the data that you had on your slide, or maybe much earlier, because you say it's 142 years, you know? Now, I, I believe the, the users then were very different from the type of users now. What and was there, was, there any, was there any data to show the frequency of drug-related arrests from 1942 to 1978, 77 years, uh, 42 years difference between the discovery or the usage of cannabis and uh, the other drug. Thank you. The frequency of drug-related arrests. Was there an increase? Because now we have more suppliers. Then we didn't know much. For those of us who are about 50, we know, you know. Okay, the stats that we have, uh, this is actually, we are just going back to 1874. 1874, that is where 142 years, uh, this is where the uh, Asians were coming in for beach timber and all this. Because actually this uh, drug, if you see the history of this drug, it actually dated back 6,000 years before Christ. In India, then it went to the Asian countries right up to Assyria in 2,700 years before Christ. It was called then the cannabis, where cannabis, the name cannabis came in. Meaning, anybody that comes in contact with this, everything around you speaks to you. That's where schizophrenia comes in. Take drugs, everything around you speaks to you. If somebody's smiling at you, let him smile. He's, he's okay. But he's seeing something on you. Maybe two horns at the back of a forehead or something. But uh, the uh, stats that we have, I can pull back 10, 10 years. But I'm using 2009 till now. 148, uh, 2009, 1,440 last year. I think we have uh, surpassed uh, the number this year. I have an online question from uh, Selina Kurleva. Sorry, my name is Pichueli and I'm a youth advocate. Question is addressed uh, to Justice Demo. When and how laws can change to be tougher on ice traffickers or distributors? Thank you. When and how laws can change to be tougher on ice traffickers and distributors? Distributors. Right? Ice traffickers. Hmm? It's trigger now. You're talking about methamphetamine. Methamphetamine. It's... it's, it's, it's uh, it's very strict now for those who want to get involved in uh, methamphetamine. If you're caught with it, for the worse. If the police gets to you, prosecutes you for methamphetamine, you're done. Your whole future is gone. Forget about study. Forget being a uh, university student. We get some students coming in and they say, ah, I'm a university student, this and that. We say, forget it. You should have opened your eyes before you deal with it. Once you deal with it in your court, your whole life is gone. You have to serve your prison sentence first. So my advice to everybody who wants to indulge in hard drugs, stay away from it. Otherwise, if you want to ruin your future, you want to live a, a life in prison where there are, you're going to be abused in prison, then deal in hard drugs. Once you're caught, don't complain when you get the punishment that's laid down by the law. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have to close now. Uh, a stern message there from Justice Temo. And uh, the maximum sentence is 20 years going to life imprisonment for uh, uh, possession of uh, hard drugs like methamphetamine. If it's uh, you found in possession uh, or manufacture uh, use 4 kg and above as stated earlier in the presentation. Uh, we'll have a lunch break, and straight after that, I request you to be back here for that session. Very important.